vous, on te reçoit aussi très brouillé, très brouillé. Encased in steel capsules, man ventures forth from the friendly environment of Earth to space beyond, to the waters below, in search of the unknown. So the new submarines of Calypso enter a landscape long forbidden, a dark and silent world. Past old boundaries, they descend to new frontiers. What had seemed alien and full of menace will grow familiar and reveal itself in beauty. Only when he can range wider, stay longer, go deeper, can man learn to utilize the incredible wealth of the sea. November 10th. Word has come from Marseille. The final adjustments have been made on our new submarines. Today, they will be shipped to us in Madagascar. The historic dockyards of Marseille are witness to the transfer of two vessels whose exploits may one day make a major contribution to the science of oceanography. Their pressure hulls are high-grade steel almost a half inch thick. There are four wide angle observation ports, three inches of solid plexiglass. They are submarines, but they are no ordinary submarines, nor is their mission ordinary. They are destined for the oceanographic research vessel, Calypso. Each weighing 4,000 pounds, the mini subs are jet propelled by powerful streams of water from their two rotating nozzles at the bow three feet in width, six and a half in length. The pilot lies prone while cameras film him. Outside, two more cameras are mounted in a bank of thousand watt floodlights, for these submarines are designed as much to film as to search and investigate. Our one-man mini-subs were spawned from Denise the two-man diving saucer we constructed in 1959. Denise was small and maneuverable, but we wanted even more maneuverability. Denise was slow and limited to 1,000 feet. We wanted more speed and twice that depth. So we created a new submarine with a smaller and stronger hull and sophisticated miniaturized machinery, the mini-sub. By using two mini subs at the same time, safety will be increased. And they will carry cameras and lights to film each other in action. After six years of design, construction, and testing, we're ready now. January 14th, Calypso steams toward Europa in the southern Indian Ocean, a tiny island 200 miles west of Madagascar. Two projects take them to Europa, one is to study the mating grounds of the great green sea turtle. Secondly, the island is a good location for testing the mini-subs. Dauphins! Des dauphins! Et voilà les dauphins! Venez, venez! No matter how often we see them, when a large school of dolphins comes to race Calypso, we crowd the rail. The Loire enters the hatch to Calypso's observation chamber. It is in the bow, 
10 feet below the waterline. Down here, we can clearly hear the squeaks and clicks of the dolphins. pounds of fine-tuned muscle, massive spine, and flukes. In motion, he is one of the most perfect examples of streamlining. Now, we are just watching the dolphins play with us. One day, we will live among them to film their complex social life in the natural environment of the sea. January 19th, Europa, 300 miles off the southeast coast of Africa. Six miles in diameter, with a shallow brackish lagoon and miles of brilliant beaches. The charts are incomplete, but apparently there is a favorable test site for the mini-subs. Captain Maritano chooses his anchorage. Now, with the ship firmly secured after a bouncing week at sea, the turtle-like subs must be stripped and every element inspected and retested. Designed by the Cousteau team of scientists and engineers, each carries a cluster of sophisticated devices for propulsion, navigation, and life support. The motor that generates the jet streams is carried in the fiberglass framework outside the hull. So are the lead-acid batteries. In the event of leaking gases or engine fires, the pilot is safe from harm. Seven days have been scheduled to check out hull, motors, valves, batteries, and controls. There is ample time to start another search. Somewhere in the waters beneath Calypso is the mating ground of the green sea turtle. around Europa, life flourishes and marred by human intervention. No one comes here to fish. No tankers dump their filth. The water is clear and unpolluted, the coral intact. Here nature has struck a balance and here it remains. Man's fatal need to strip and spoil and scar has not yet reached this island. Thank you. 
Somewhere in this liquid paradise, there lies the love ground of the turtles. At twilight, Bunny Sea encounters two exceptionally large stingrays that have settled down to rest. Roused from their sandy blanket by his approach, they circle warily and move off. As Bunny C swims round a coral outcropping to head off the rays, he is suddenly confronted by an incredible gathering of turtles preparing for their march from the sea. It is January 20th. Throughout the African summer, from November to April, the primitive, eternal, stirring in their blood brings them back to Europa. They come from Mozambique and Madagascar, from Obia, Mombasa, and the shores of the Comores, north along the trenches, south from their pastures on sunken reefs, all the way from far Cape Gardafui. Some will swim a thousand miles or more before their journey is done. Shy, lumbering, perhaps a hundred years old and four times that many pounds in flesh and carapace. Yet somehow, in the sea, they have uncommon grace. By the thousands, they gather as they have gathered for centuries to wait the moment of partnership. The gentle ladies and the fat-tailed bulls. January 22nd. Verifications on the mini-subs are still keeping the technicians busy. Today, the divers will establish a base camp on the island to study the turtles when they come ashore. seductive beauty of Europa does not persist much further inland than her beaches. She is not hospitable to human life. Over all the flatland of her interior, there hangs a fetid, marshy odor. Her waters are undrinkable. Only the most hardy could hold on to life, and many have failed. The few pathetic attempts to settle on Europa have ended in tragedy. Ici repose Marie Virginie Beauchamp, décédée à l'île d'Europa le 1er mars 1910. Bien, mon ami Dominique, il fait pas bon vivre dans cette île. Thirst took them or perhaps disease, or even loneliness. They left no records but their graves. Little endures but stone, the ancient coral that had built the land itself. Along the shore, the silent angular frigate birds keep watch. On Europa, the bird and the turtle are strange partners in nature's scheme. For most of the day, Falco, cameraman McKay, divers Sumion and Bonacy have trekked the island seeking the most popular nesting sites for the great sea turtles. Like every member of Calypso's team, Falco plays many roles. Diver and operations chief, technician and navigator, he is also a skilled naturalist. Living as he has so intimately and long among creatures of the sea, Falco has come to know their secret lives 
and private ways, as few will ever know them. As the tide comes in, the great shells form a line, waiting their turn to come ashore, looking for an easy slope to climb. Some are returning to the same 200-yard stretch of beach where they last laid their eggs, perhaps two years ago. How do they know? How can they tell without exploring it? Which stretch of beach will offer them safe nesting for their eggs? What marvelous instinctive memory survives in the cells from age to age to bring them here with such precision? They are the oldest type of living reptiles, more ancient in lineage than the dinosaur. Once they were land creatures, gradually one branch of the family has chosen the sea. Their shells lengthened, their feet became flippers. They became well adapted to marine life, but they still must come ashore to lay their eggs, as the incubation of eggs requires warmth from the sun. Besides, although the adult turtles can stay submerged for hours, the newly hatched must breathe frequently. The nest must be on land. Awkward and gentle, armed with neither tooth nor claw, the female is defenseless now. Any hunter can take her with ease. But here, no one has ever hunted her. She is protected by law and by 200 miles of isolating sea. Here, the nights are safe and the scents abundant. With her wide front flippers, first she digs a basin large enough to accommodate her. The sand she can't help flinging on the lenses of her eyes is washed away by a steady flow of tears. The task demands an Olympian effort from creatures who have shed the muscle structure needed to carry their weight on land. Once the basin is prepared, the hind flippers begin to drill a cylindrical well. The eggs will be deposited there, well beyond the reach of coconut crabs. And then it is time. Each nest contains almost exactly 100 eggs. Soft and tough, they will stay in the sand for nearly 60 days before the young emerge. She has carried the promise of life many thousands of miles. This is why she has come, and this is why the frigate birds wait. This has been a pilgrimage, a return to the land from whence they came millions of years ago. Here, at this essential juncture of their present and their past, not just individual animals, but all the race is temporarily in jeopardy. Often the labors last all night. She must return before the sun gets high. Caught away from the water, she will bake and die. Even if the sun is hidden by cloud, the immense effort of lifting her carapace to breathe will exhaust her. Even after she reaches the sea, 
she will not be home until the tide comes in. She will wander among the coral heads, seeking a passage channel to the deep. Confused with exhaustion, perhaps, this turtle has climbed inland as the day returns, away from the saving sea. Her navigation powers, precise enough to take her over 1,400 miles of empty sea to a tiny island landfall, have fatally let her down. Another one has blundered into a route. She cannot walk backwards and is too weakened to just bulldoze ahead. Along the beach, there is grim witness to her future. Soon, like many of her sisters, she will be through. The sun will have done its work. The hermit crabs will start on theirs. While Falco and Banasi mount a rescue of the trapped turtle, far up on the dune, Goupil and Bena have found the lost one and turned her around to the sea. This species developed an original deferred childbearing scheme. Directly after having deposited her eggs, the female is ready to mate and conceive young for the next egg laying, two or three years hence. So courtship dancers follow egg laying, and the lady leads the reel. It is she who remains on watch for danger. It is she who decides when the pair will surface to breathe. The male just closes his eyes and clings firmly onto his mate. Then the partners go their separate ways. January 27th. The week is up. Mola reports the mini subs are ready. Today, Falco will make a preliminary dive in number one. The complex routine of checklist and countdown must be precise and complete. The directional gyro on the mini sub is aligned with Calypso's own gyro compass, with headings called down from the bridge by intercom. 
Combien 279. 279. 280. 280. Ça y est, 280 Oui, c'est bon, merci. Oxygen okay. supply, hydraulic pump and pressures, emergency escape gear, controls free and functioning. Communications good. Whenever we test something new in the field for the first time, the atmosphere aboard becomes silent and tense. Falco and I have been together now for more than 15 years. I often feel I have delegated my eyes to him. I identify with his reports as if I had lived them. This is a moment when the full resources of Calypso concentrate upon a single focal point. Each man has his station, each his responsibilities. There are few orders, little talk of any kind. A final check on the line telephone before it is detached. At surface pressure, all is well. The hull is tight, power is good. Sumion unshackles the last line. Now Falco is on his own. Taking a camera, Delois will follow the sub down in the first phase of the dive. The mood on the sonar telephone is one of banter. So far, he is among old friends, and it is familiar territory. Falco guides the mini sub with a single joystick. On it are mounted separate controls for power, sonar transmitter, tape recorder, camera start, and cine lights. The sub has reached 300 feet. To arrest his descent at this level, he has released two of his 21 small lead weights. Each weighs two pounds. Moving the control stick forward will send 120 pounds of mercury into the nose and tilt it down. Now he descends more slowly, listening, checking. At 20 atmospheres, the total pressure on his capsule exceeds 1,200 tons. It is still cooling, shrinking, slowly dropping into the blackness. There's little plant life now. These leaf-like structures are colonies of animals, gorgonians, fan coral. At 660 feet, Falco reports to Lebar. All is well. Est-ce que tu es arrivé au fond à toi? Cruising forward under the steady thrust of his two maneuvering jets, his lights make galaxies out of the plankton here. Now there are chains of salpas. Normally single jelly-like hollow spools that move slowly by pulsations the salpas have joined together in an undulating snake-like team to swim among the brine shrimp they devour. 
880 feet and a pressure of 26 times that on the surface. He will cruise a few minutes at this level. He has been down an hour, one third of his planned time. Est-ce que l'eau est claire? Est-ce que l'eau est claire? À toi. In mid response, he is cut off. Le Bon listens and waits. If the sonar telephone has failed, perhaps the power has failed. Now they can only wait and trust in the cool head of the man below. In utter blackness, he must release his ascent ballast and float without power back to the surface. The sonar launch cruises over the steady beeps of the automatic transmitter mounted outside the shell. Eight minutes pass. Last item on the checklist, the inflatable safety skirt for abandoning ship in heavy seas. Despite the tension of a power failure at the bottom, Falco pursues the routine to the end of the test. For the next few minutes, of course, we will be overwhelmed with technical reports. But a vivid, direct account from Falco is what I am really waiting for. <coughs> Falco reports to Captain Cousteau and to Jean Mollard, the mini-sub's chief engineer. The fault appears to have been in the motor, which had faltered, groaned, and then stopped, apparently shorting out, and draining the power from the batteries. So something went wrong. When it is not the wind, or the currents, or the swell, it has to be a mechanical bug. The offending motor is pulled, and through the night the engineers track down and correct the failure. Distinctions between diver and engineer, ship's crew and submarine specialist, dissolve at times like this. By dawn, both subs are ready. January 25th, Captain Cousteau and Falco will dive as partners now, the way it is meant to be. Cousteau enters mini sub number two at 7.04 that morning. He runs through the pre-dive checks at 7.23, he is lowered into the sea. The divers run smoothly through their drill. Release the sling clean the windows, visual check with the pilot, and then release the telephone cord and the nylon safety line. 
At 7.29, Falco, his checklist already run, enters number one. And one minute later, follows his captain into the water. Again, the divers run their scrupulous exterior check, and then the two are free. Now, as we descend together, all the troubles of our six years' work are well repaid. We still have much to learn about the piloting of these little hot rods, but this is part of our excitement. From the start, they proved just as unpredictable as they are seductive. Like the gentle meeting of champagne goblets, the mini subs touch in quiet salute. The testing is completed. Now their career can begin. February 4th. To verify reports that some female turtles remain on the reef after they have filled one nest with their eggs, Falco has returned with his shore party to mark and trace movements of a pair of late returning mothers. Hydrogen filled balloons will help the tracking. The shell, like fingernails, contains no nerves. The turtles seem unperturbed at being drilled though anxious to be off. One of the balloons goes straight to the open sea and starts a deliberate northbound journey. This turtle, it seems, is through with her egg-laying task. Two days later, Laban sights the second marking balloon, less than a mile from the ship. She has proved our point. She has stayed at Europa. Now we must join her, film her for our records, and release her. Delwa goes down with Sumia to photograph. Tracking the turtle helps demonstrate that females remain around the island until they have laid all their eggs. They may make as many as five trips to the beach in one single season and leave behind as many as 500 eggs. Our turtle has done her part of the study and can be released with thanks. February 8th. Above the empty beach, the frigate birds still keep their diligent patrols, silent, watchful. The babies have hatched some hours before and climbed to just below the surface of the sand, their shells still soft as leather. At some unknown confluence of signals, heat and humidity perhaps, they break out. Immediately they sense the right direction and begin their short critical march to the sea.
Even the sea cannot save them. When they surface to breathe, they are taken. Unless they hatch at night, when the frigates cannot see them, or in storms when the wind has driven the birds inland, they stand no chance. Of the more than a hundred hatchlings in this nest, apart from those in Falco's canvas sack, the number of survivors is zero. Death is an instrument of nature's equilibrium. Only man is capable of killing without need. But man also feels compelled to reach out and try to save life whenever it is threatened. My men begin to gather up hatchlings and to devise a scheme. No one knows exactly how they sense the direction of the ocean even when it is out of sight. Their seaward drive seems inexhaustible. Few obstacles deter them. They can survive a week of this struggle without food, although in nature it is seldom more than minutes till they reach their goal. Half a mile out to sea, Falco releases a few turtles beneath an empty sky. Photograph from below, the hatchlings plunge, surface to breathe and plunge again. It seems safe. The sky stays clear. The hatchlings strike out surely toward the open sea. Less than two minutes later, shadows swoop above them. From out of nowhere, the frigates have arrived. For the few tired survivors of this nest, Falco prepares another pool, closer to the water. He will protect it from the frigate birds till nightfall, and then release them. The men place the makeshift cover on the pool, and then retire. A scheme that sets the frigate's nose out of joint. Night. The frigates have gone. The hatchlings still prowl the confines of their station, seeking a route to the sea. Released even in utter darkness or dazzled by the camera lights, they head unerringly down the beach, except one. He seems to prefer the safety of Falco's pool, so they call him Corrigan, of wrong way fame. Finally, Corrigan pauses and seems to sniff the air. Sensing some clue, he answers a summons that has compelled his race since long before they were men. The rest are nearly there already. They still risk the jaws of hungry fish, but most will survive the night. still headstrong, encounters a lady old enough to be his mother. Maybe she is his mother. She doesn't know or care. 
Once their eggs are laid, turtles have no interest in the product of their nest. Corrigan hitches a ride on her flipper, and together they go down to the sea. These little fellows are now exactly six weeks old. Moments after they hatched, a member of Calypso expedition put them in a plastic bag with a little sea water and took off from Europa's small and rough landing strip on a Piper Aztec. 48 hours later, they were safely here in the Monaco Museum. Their carapace is still soft but they have already started to grow. On the island of Europa alone, almost four million turtles are hatched each year. Most are doomed, harvested by the birds. We have upset the balance of nature by capturing a few. Turtles could be found. They are a possible protein source for an undernourished world. In most areas, man has hunted the green turtle almost to extinction, sometimes very cruelly. The species is, almost everywhere, in real danger. Whether a fisherman uses net and harpoon, or a modern panoply of radar, sonar, and battery thermographs to guide his electric nets, he ruthlessly depletes the resources of the ocean. On Europa, we witness the drama of the sea turtles, and moved by a moral impulse that may be artificial, we rescued two adult females, as well as some babies that grew up in the public aquarium of Monaco. In doing so, we interfered with natural mechanisms. This journey has given us an immense respect for nature. <laughs> 